Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week uh, of sessions. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Sid, is it okay if you can lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Go ahead. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Father, thank you for this day you have given us, Lord, the word from your word, what we are going to learn from, Lord, from your word, Lord. Whatever we will be learning, Lord, whatever the Pastor Paul is going to teach us, Lord, let it should not be just kept in our hearts, Lord, but it should be revealing us, and Lord, Lord, when other people see us, Lord, they should see the change in our life, Lord, they should see the blessing we are going through, Lord. We should reveal and manifest the godly character, Lord. Whatever this APC Bible College is putting the seed in our, in our hearts, Lord. They are equipping us to do the ministry, Lord. Lord, everything they are doing, Lord, bless us, Lord. Bless the teacher, Lord. Bless the students who are learning, Lord, about your word, Lord. Lord, we need your fear to learn about your word, Lord. Lord, give us everything. Lord, give us wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sid. All right. Uh, before we go ahead, let's just do a quick review of what we did last week. Last week, we talked about understanding the blood covenant. And we saw that the blood covenant uh, is the strongest covenant that God has ever made. Right? And we looked at the verse where uh, the entire chapter where you know God makes this blood covenant with Abraham. He says, Abraham, you have believed what I've said. And what does God do? He, he makes him you know, put an offering there. And then finally, the Lord God himself walks through the offering and he makes a blood covenant. And after the blood covenant, he says, a sign will be given to you. And then that sign was uh, circumcision. And and we see that a blood covenant, we, we studied there last week, that the blood covenant is the strongest bond on earth. It's like God was telling Abraham, Abraham, I know you have a lot of questions. I'm, uh, you know, I'm telling you that you're going to be a father to many nations. Maybe you'll go back home and say, I don't even have a son. But I am making this covenant, not on my own words, I'm making this covenant, not, not because I'm just saying it, but I'm making a blood covenant with you. Right now, when somebody enters a blood covenant, when we read further on uh, from the Levitical offerings, blood covenant refers to life uh, uh, where you have to be willing to each party is supposed to be willing to give their life uh, for the other person. Right. So it's like God is telling Abraham, I'm willing to do all I can to fulfill my side of the covenant. And a blood covenant is a covenant of love. Uh, you know, only when we love one another is when we can do anything for them at any cost. And God was basically telling Abraham that it is out of love that I'm making this covenant with you, out of a promise uh, that, that will never go unanswered. And then a blood covenant is a covenant of protection. God tells Abraham, no matter who you will have to fight, no matter what happens ahead, uh, I'm going to take you to a land that you don't even know of. It's going to be new people, new places. There may be uh, you know, uh, battles that you will have to fight. Remember, as this blood covenant that I'm giving you, Abraham, you will have protection from my side. And so Abraham, we saw last week that he believed God and God made this wonderful covenant, the blood covenant. He changed his identity. He, he gave him a seal of circumcision. And God tells everyone, whoever is part of this seal uh, or part of this covenant will be blessed. Right? And then we looked at a few revelations uh, of, of the blood covenant where uh, he himself became the Jehovah Jireh uh, and God himself backs up the covenant. And let's pick up from the blood covenant with Moses and Israel. Right? Uh, let's learn what happened. I'm sure we all know the story of uh, you know, how God used Moses uh, to bring the people of Israel out of bondage from Egypt uh, into the promised land which God had promised. Right. So let's look at a few uh, insights. And also we will see some of the covenants that God made 
uh, to Abraham, to uh, Moses, and which we also see in the Levitical offerings. First one, Passover. Passover was a type of redemption. Now, we all know the Feast of the Passover. right? God made this promise to Moses, and he says, Moses, I'm going to bring you out on the last the last plague or pestilence that is going to hit Egypt, what you do is you take your people, you go into your home, you cut a lamb, a, an unblemished lamb. You take the blood of that lamb. You put it on your doorpost. Right? And when death comes, it will pass by. Death will pass over. And so to commemorate that, even now, the Passover is the most celebrated festival uh, that we that the Jews, uh, you know, follow. Uh, we are on page sixty-three uh, on the notes, uh, uh Blood covenant with Moses in Israel, right? So uh, it was a type of redemption. So even now, when we translate it in the New Testament. It is the blood of Jesus that keeps us from sin. It is the blood of Jesus that saves us from death. Right? Uh, and so God gave Moses the law and he established a blood covenant. Because God was saying, okay, you cut the lamb, you put it on the doorpost, and that's that blood, because of the blood of that lamb, death will pass by. None of you will taste death. And that's what happened. Right? It was the last plague. The blood was put, death came, and none of those who had the blood of the lamb on the post uh, died. But everyone else who did not have it died. It was, it was like God saying, uh, they are part of the covenant. And when you're part of the covenant, there's protection. Right. Uh, let's read this portion. It's a, a long portion. Exodus chapter 24, verse 1 to 8. Uh, yes, could one of us please read that? Exodus 24, 1 to 8. Exodus 24, 1 to 8. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So we see here that uh, God is, you know, the people have come out. Uh, they're on the exodus. They're on the way. God is giving very specific instructions to Moses. He says, Moses... I've brought you out of Egypt now. Y'all are uh, in this place, in the uh, desert. Now, here's what I want you to do. Go and tell the people not to come up the mountain, but take the blood of this lamb and take half of it, put it on the altar, use the other half, sprinkle it over the people. And this will be a blood covenant according to the words that I have spoken. Right? Uh, and later on, we see that Moses... And then the Aaronic priesthood became mediators of that covenant. Uh, Aaron became the first high priest. And with, with this blood covenant already set in place, they became the mediators. So it was like, uh, you know, uh, Aaron is standing there. The blood 
of the animals or later on we see that the offerings were brought to the high priest and the high priest would take those offerings and offer it to god as a high uh, as a mediator and i love what the book of hebrews teaches us jesus christ is our high priest our mediator now everything in the old testament has you know sometimes when we read it we may think why all this you know uh, so complicated but it has meaning because right now the lord jesus in heaven the book of hebrews says that he's standing as our high priest and our mediator and what is he doing he is standing as a mediator through the blood through his own blood that's why we sing no um, you know we and we enter his throne room not by the blood of rams or bulls but by the blood of jesus so here we see that there were mediators high priests and now we've got this perfect mediator jesus who is standing who has made the blood covenant uh, eternal right and so all through from exodus we see that every offering every sacrifice every feast that they celebrated when we read through exodus and leviticus numbers every aspect has a meaning to it right now let's look at a few sacrifices and feasts right that god initiated during the time of moses right we know that god gave moses the 10 commandments and the mosaic law he told uh, moses okay you build a tabernacle you build uh, an ark you you in the tabernacle you have these you have the outer court you have the inner court the holy place and this is will be a place where you will offer the sacrifices and uh, these are the kinds of offerings these are the kinds of sacrifices there's a whole list of things right uh and also he you know when we read the book of numbers god even tells the tribes where to camp it's not like they would you know walk in ex- in the desert and say okay well, i feel this place is good let me camp here no uh, god tells them exactly where should the tribe of benjamin be where should the tribe of judah camp and so everything was very meticulously done by the lord by god because everything has a significance in the new covenant sometimes we read you know uh, when i read this i think you know god used moses to do such wonderful works but only because he hit that stone the second time what does god tell him god tells moses moses you will not enter the promised land because of your disobedience you will not enter the promised land uh you know uh, so so what about the others what about the other israelites they did all kinds of sins they did everything possible but they all entered uh maybe moses thought why you know you you told me to uh, you know speak to it but you know i hit it but there was a significance there was something that god wanted to portray and bring out uh and so for everything every feast every a way of worship had a reason in the old covenant right and we can't say that all of the things in the old covenant uh are you know uh, don't apply now in the new covenant there are certain you know we can take in certain aspects certain points uh which is which in the new covenant will relate to the old covenant so let's look at a few of them right first one the feast of the passover we know that the blood was put on the door posts and you know death passed by the same way christ is our redeemer and he's our redemption right uh those people who were in the homes with the blood on the door posts they were redeemed they were redeemed they were the ones who walked out of egypt into the promised land the feast of the passover is is one of the most beautiful feasts uh you know if we read the history of the passover it is the most celebrated feast it's something like christmas for us it's 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 a time of joy it's a time of celebration it's a time where the jews especially they say god overcame uh, god helped us and brought us out of egypt so it was a celebratory uh feast right and people would come from 
all over different parts of the world, uh, different parts of Europe. They would come to Israel, to Jerusalem, to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. Right? That is why when we look at the book of Acts, right? Uh, why were there so many people in uh, Jerusalem? People of different languages. There were people of Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, all kinds of people were there. Why? Because the Jews from different places would come to the main, the center, which is Jerusalem, to celebrate the Passover. Right. So it was a it was a joyous time. Right. Uh, the second feast was the feast of the unleavened bread. Now. Let me give you a context on what the feast is, so that we can relate it to uh, what's ha what in the New Testament. The feast of the unleavened bread is is nothing but they would the the Jews would take barley, and they would you know uh, make that barley unleavened, right? So it it wouldn't be mixed with anything. It would just be barley. Uh, and they would mix it and they would eat that for about seven days and it would be tasteless, right? It is, uh, there's no taste. But the point of this feast of the unleavened bread was to commemorate that we were living in sin in Egypt, but God in his mighty hand brought us out and this we are now not living in sin anymore. And so we don't want the things of this world to come into us and make us sinful, right? So the moment you put additional things into that uh, unleavened bread, it becomes a leavened bread. It becomes, you know, uh, something else. So what they would do is they would not add anything into the flour of barley. So they would leave it just as it is. What does it commemorate? Okay, we were living in sin. Right, and and it is it commemorates that now we are cleansed, we are washed away from sin. Sin is removed from us. Right, and so that is what the feast of the unleavened bread is. Now, when we read in the New Testament, we see that the Lord Jesus uh, removed our sins. He is the bread of life. Right? Jesus Himself said that I am the bread of life. He was relating to that unleavened bread, uh, the bread that takes away the, the sins, or not takes away, but covers the sin, cleanses them. I'm sure in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, when Jesus said, this is my body, I'm sure the disciples may be wondering, how, how is this body? Uh, how is this his body? Maybe they thought that, but he was trying to say this bread when you eat of it, it will cleanse away your sins. It will wash away your sins. Now, this unleavened bread, again, was a, is a time. Some, some people would have it for seven days. It would go on for many more days. People could, you know, if they'd like, they could go on for 30 days. Uh, but again, it is to commemorate that we are no longer living in sin. Right? Same thing the Lord Jesus did for us. The feast, next one, the feast of the first fruits. Speaking of our new life in Christ and what the Lord Jesus did for us by offering himself uh, for, for us. Now, the feast of the first fruits also is a very interesting feast. This is a feast where uh, it's a feast of redemption. Right? Uh, the feast of the first fruits, usually the book of Ruth is read through that whole uh, feast in in. You know, in the new covenant, when we see that during the time of Jesus and the early church, they would read the book of Ruth as a redemption story. But what is this feast of the first fruits? Those who are working, those who have crops and cattle and uh, uh, vegetation, what they would do is when the time of harvest is ready, they would have to go right into the middle of their land and they would take out the best crops, right? Uh, take out the best crops and they would keep that aside, go to the temple and offer them as a sacrifice to God, right? They are not to eat of it. Now, if they eat of the first fruits, they will have to go back and make a sin offering, right? It's not like, you know, uh, 
you know, uh, oh, I forgot I ate. And now I have to, you know, uh, go back and make a sin offering. No, they should consciously be aware. Okay, the feast is coming up. The fruits are ready. The first batch, usually what they would do is the corner sides of the field. This I'm talking about during the uh, old, you know, during history. I'm talking about history where during the corner sides of the of the land, they would, the crops that are there, they would not use that. They would usually leave those corner sides of the plot, vegetation and fruits or vegetables, whatever they were growing. They would leave that as, uh, as, 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 you know, something that they would donate to people or uh, to bless other people, right? So the feast of the first fruits is the first fruits that you get uh, from your labor, right? Now, mostly, mostly it is vegetation, right? Like crops, pomegranate, oil. So these are the normally the things that they would grow. And uh, uh, so, so this feast, again, it is to... Tell God, you have blessed me. Whatever I have here is the best of what you have given me. Right? And so when we look at the new covenant as well, we see it as tithe. Right? We give one-tenth first of what God has blessed us with. And then additionally, we can give uh, more as well. Uh, but it is to commemorate this life that we have in Christ, a life of giving, a life of blessing, uh, and and a life of also offering uh, ourselves to the Lord. Then comes the Feast of the Pentecost. Right now, the Feast of the Pentecost was a feast. The word penta means fifty, right? Uh, five Pentecost, fifty days. Uh, so this feast usually lasted for a long time. Uh, and what they would do is they would believe uh, in in the power of God to flow in them. There would be extended times of prayer. There would be extended times of, uh, you know, spending time meditating God's word, being in God's presence. Uh, and, and they would wait on the Lord. Some, some Jews would very seriously, you know, even avoid work uh, during the season. Uh, but we know that others will have to work. So uh, there were some who would fast and work. But even as they work, they will remember that this is a time where we're seeking God. It was, you know, the Jews during those times, history says that they would work not as, you know, just to fill their stomachs. That's it. Not to, you know, not for business or for other reasons. Uh, and it was a time of just staying and meditating on God, remembering God for everything that he is. And so that's what the Feast of the Pentecost is. They believed that the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God uh, will you know, really flow in them as they you know, uh, uh, celebrate the Feast of the Pentecost. And uh, that is why in the New Covenant as well, it's, it's, it's wonderful that God chose the day of Pentecost itself to, you know, to pour out his Holy Spirit upon the people uh, who are in the upper room. The next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, this feast is a feast of victory and triumph. Now, in uh, in uh, times in the in history and during the time of Moses, what they would do is they would blow the horn of a shofar. Uh, it's a it's an animal, uh, just like uh, just like a, a bigger version of a deer, uh, and they would blow that horn. Right. Uh, now, what is the Feast of the Trumpets all about? It is a feast to commemorate how God triumphantly brought us out of Egypt. To remember that in his mighty hand, he sent the plagues. He sent all this. He, he parted the seas into two. And we walked through the seas. And uh, he provided for manna. There was water going with, uh, with us. Uh, and the feast of the trumpet uh, uh, trumpets is a is a feast which declares that you know they are victorious. Uh, the word trumpet, uh, I mean, the usage of trumpet is mostly to alert, or even when there is a victory, uh, or when there's ready for battle, uh, a trumpet is blown. 
uh, so this this whole feast was to remember and commemorate that that Jesus sorry God was victorious now when you translate that to the new testament colossians the book of colossians chapter 1 paul is writing and he says he was victorious where he made a public spectacle of the enemy he overcame and he's victorious and 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 so all through the new testament we see christ victorious the book of Revelation talks about how trumpets will be blown and the victory of the Lord will, will be shown upon people. Right? So again, to commemorate that in the Old Covenant, even in the New Covenant, the Lord Jesus fulfilled that victory. Then comes the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement is a day of mourning. Right? Nobody works. So God told Moses, listen, this day of atonement is a day you will sit and you will pray and, you know, spend time meditating on the word of God. And there is no work. Right? So they just have to sit. And they would pray and say, God, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my sins. Right? That's all the whole day they would pray for. Right? Forgive me of my sins. And so... The whole day, they would fast, they would pray, they would, uh, you know, read scriptures, they would sing songs. It was not a celebration, but it's about their own life. They would say, okay, I'm a sinner, but God is a holy God. How can we make atonement for this? So they would sit and pray. But at, towards the end of the day, what they would do is they would go, take a lamp or an animal, unblemished, take it go to the altar and they would sacrifice that and that blood would be smeared on the offering saying Christ, the, the, the blood has covered your sins and now you have no sin in you. It has covered the day of atonement as the sacrifice is made, the blood has covered your sins. So they would do that offering, they would go back home. That is the day of atonement. Now, Christ's atoning work on the cross did not just cover sins, but it washed away our sins. Now, can you picture this? John the Baptist, there's 400 years of silence, right? After Malachi, 400 years of silence. God has sent prophet after prophet after prophet, but the Israelites, the Jews are just doing whatever they want to do. 400 years silence. They've been doing all these things. Feast of the Passover, Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Feast of the Pentecost, Feast of Trump, all these things they've been doing. But what has happened here is it has become, it's not something that they're doing it out of reverence for God, but it's become a ritual, just a practice. So for example, the Day of Atonement comes, oh, I'm sorry, God, you know, I shouldn't have done this. Uh, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. They go cut the offering, uh, put it on the, uh, uh, you know, give it to the high priest. The high priest will pray and then it's done. They go back, they'll sin again. So it became, a, you know, like a routine. And that is why when John, John the Baptist comes, Israel was in a complete mess, I would say. Their religious condition was very bad. The Jews were doing what they wanted to do. The high priests were happy. They were getting offerings. The Pharisees were happy. The Sadducees were happy. The Jews were happy. They were hardly, there was no reverence for God because all of these became just a, you know, a ritual, a practice. It didn't have meaning in them anymore. That is why, you know, John the Baptist says, to the Pharisees and to Sadducees, God can raise up Abraham from the stone itself. Right? And so during these times, when during Moses' time, it was done out of reverence. And when we look through and read through the Old Testament, as prophets came and went, prophets came and went, the entire, you know, the weight of these offerings and sacrifices was lost. Finally, the last was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now, again, this feast was a feast of enjoyment. It is a feast where people would come from different parts again. What they would do is it was to 
this feast was mainly to remember that when God brought us out of Egypt, we were journeying through the desert. God gave us rest. We stayed in small huts and houses, but God protected us. And, and so what they would do even right now is, uh, especially uh, you know, staunch Jews in Jerusalem, what they would do is they would, you know, they would go to somewhere away in the desert. They would build... Uh, you know, s small houses, uh, you know, basically just rooms, uh, one side out of bamboo, and then they would cover it with hay or sticks. And the reason they did that was because they wanted to commemorate that when we came out of Egypt, we were living in these kind of places, these kind of huts, I would say. And when we lived there, God still provided for us. Right. And God was with us through this whole journey into the promised land. So it was to remember that. So even now, you know, if you go to Jerusalem uh, and certain places, you will see that when, especially they'll go find some empty place, they would, you know, build those, uh, you know, small tents kind. Uh, and use, sometimes they leave the upper portion open so that when rain comes, it should come into the tent signifying the blessings of God. And so all of these are wonderful to learn uh, uh, and, and how they, you know, relate to the new covenant. The Lord Jesus himself, uh, you know, gave us rest when we were, well, what does the Bible say in the book of Romans, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made a way. He gave us rest. He provided for us. Right. So we come to an end on this chapter. Um, and it's any anybody have any questions, any thoughts uh, on the offerings? Does it uh, is it something that you're able to understand? You have any questions? Everyone okay? Yes, Pastor. Okay. I just don't know in what page we are. Okay, we are at page 63. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're looking at, we just looked at the sacrifices and the feasts. So any questions on the sacrifices? Uh, you know, we've not gone into the, you know, what kind of sacrifice, but when we read the book of Numbers, Leviticus Numbers, uh, God tells Moses what kind of animal, what kind of sacrifice, which are the blood offerings, which ones are you you know you don't offer the blood, which ones. So it, it, there's a lot of technical things that God gives them, but then we're just looking at how these covenants were fulfilled uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Should we go ahead? Should we go to the next chapter? Yes, Pastor. All right. Okay, let's go to the next chapter. Now we've we saw all of these things in the old covenant. Go to chapter four, people of the covenant. The old covenant affected the people in their everyday lives, right? So uh, even during the Exodus, even when they were in the Promised Land, God told Abraham, sorry, uh, Moses, write down whatever happened during the Exodus. And then he wrote it down. He said, remember this, remember that. And Deuteronomy was a book of remembrance. Now, as people of the old covenant, everything, God was there in every aspect of their lives, right? How the covenant affected them in their workplace or even in uh, even those who are high priests, those who are in business, in every area, family, there was a covenant set in place. Now, with that in mind, let's look at how we, you and I, being part of the new covenant, how are we to respond to what God has done for us? What are the things that we can take as people who are in covenant with God? Right? Now, remember that being in covenant with God, God is the one who initiated this covenant, right? 
we did not say god please send your son into this world to die on the cross for us no god himself initiated it right so god has given us the opportunity to enter the covenant so as people of his covenant what is it that we can receive from him of course there are plenty of things but let's look at a few things right exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 can one of us please read that exodus 19 verse 5 Exodus chapter nineteen verse five. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my command covenant, then it shall be a special prayer to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Amen. Let's also read the next one. Exodus thirty four ten. Exodus. Chapter six, four, verse ten, and he said, "Behold, I make a covenant before all your people, and I will, I will do mother, mother, such as have not been done in all the heart, nor, nor in my nation, and all the people among whom you have shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing." That I will do with you. Amen. Amen. So we see here, God is telling Moses, Exodus nineteen five, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now this covenant, as we are part of God's covenant as well, this holds true for us as well. Right? Where God is saying, "If you obey my voice, we keep you keep my commandment, you will be a special treasure to Him." And He goes on to say, "I will do marvels that I have never done before." Of course, God is telling uh, Moses that you know I'm going to do these great things for the nation of Israel, for your people. But as part of God's covenant, we can receive this and say, "God, I know that you will do marvels in my life as well." Uh, that the work of the Lord, uh, and people will see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. These are promises that we can apply as people of His covenant. Right? We see this reflected in Peter's sermon in Acts three twenty-five. He says, "You are the sons of the prophets." and of the covenant which god made with our fathers saying abraham and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed so peter is remembering you know jesus has died and he's gone he's resurrected to heaven and they are ready to start the ministry peter is remembering the covenant that god made Long time back with Abraham saying, "In your seed all families shall be blessed." So how do we apply it to our lives? We say, "God, as part of your covenant, my family shall be blessed. My the generation to generation. Remember the the blood covenant goes on four generations and more. So we can say, God, through this covenant that you've made, my family shall be blessed." My children, my children's children, and go going on from generation to generation. God draws a distinction between those who obey Him and those who disobey and do not know Him. When we read through the Old Testament, we see that God sent prophet after prophets, but God knew the people who will follow Him, and God. uh you know he knew the people who disobeyed and you know rejected him god draws a distinction let's read exodus chapter 8 21 to 23 go ahead anyone exodus chapter 8 verse 21 to 23 all else if you will not let my people go Behold I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants on your people and into your houses 
the houses of the egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand and in that day i will set apart the land of goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that i am the lord in the midst of the land i will make a difference between my people and your people tomorrow this sign shall be amen thank you roslin so we see here and then we read on the other portions as well we are seeing that god is telling the people now i'm going to make a difference if you do not let my people go these are the troubles that will come upon you later on he says uh, the livestock of israel will all uh, sorry of egypt will all die the land of goshen the children of israel will uh, uh, nothing will happen to them but there will be hail on the people of egypt then uh, there will be darkness on the people of egypt and then we saw that the first born of egypt will die god draws a distinction now why do we why does he do that because we see in, in in the old testament god revealed his power and he gave people the opportunity to believe in him and so does he do even now in the new covenant as god has given each one of us we are part of his covenant he gives people the opportunity to come and to believe now in god's mercy he does not you know it's not like god says okay you don't believe in me you're going to die in 2 days or your life is going to be taken away from you or you're going to go through the sickness it is god's mercy that he doesn't allow that but god draws a distinction he says these are my children these are my people right you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation why does he say all that because when we are part of the covenant he draws a distinction God loves the world the same way John 3:16 loves the world that he gave us life but he draws a distinction for those who believe and those who do not believe great wonders he will do for you and me as people of his covenant so even as we go about in our ministry in our studies in our uh, in the work workplace anything that we're doing remember that God sees us differently God sees us as part of his covenant the lord is willing to do all these miraculous miraculous works that he has done in the old covenant he's willing to do that and more in the new covenant right next he says that you are a special people deuteronomy uh chapter 7 verse 6 to 11 yes could one of us please read Deuteronomy chapter 7 6 to 11 Should I read? Go ahead. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 to 11 For you are a holy people to the Lord your God the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth the lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people for you are the least of all peoples but because the lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers the lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of pharaoh king of egypt therefore know that the lord your god he is god the faithful god who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments and he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them he will not be slack with him who hates him he will repay him to his face therefore you shall keep the commandment the statute and the judgments which i command you today to observe them amen thank you roslin so here in deuteronomy he is reminding moses is reminding the people listen you are a holy people to the lord you are chosen you are a special treasure and he goes on to say 
that those who love him he will honor them and and those who uh, try to you know uh, who don't obey him and dishonor him he will bring trouble and wrath upon them right now i want to focus on this aspect of being a special treasure he says that when you are a special treasure above the people of the face of the earth maybe sometimes we may feel god i'm you know i'm there i'm i'm here i'm your child i'm part of the covenant but doesn't look like i am blessed doesn't look like people are honoring me you know people don't respect me maybe sometimes we feel that way but i want to encourage you do we can stand and we must understand that we are part of god's covenant and we have already received all of this people may not understand it right but you say who you are maybe in the workplace you you know people are mocking and people are making fun of you and you do, you see that you know you've been working sincerely but things are not going right uh you know and those who have been doing the wrong things have been growing and those who have, you know you've been sincere but nothing's happening remember god is a god of covenant you are a special generation a special treasure to him continue to trust in him right continue to believe because you are part of the covenant right you may feel god you know uh, i'm part of the covenant but I, i'm not able to experience any of your blessings no he's there his blessings are there his grace is there his mercy is there he's extending it to us we have to just you know hold on and continue to trust in him right so let's take a break we'll pick up from overtaken with blessings uh, after we take a break we'll come back at 11:00 let's take a break